Archaeologists were thrilled to uncover what is believed to be the oldest painting in the world after a diver discovered a Stone Age cave 37 meters underwater. The discovery was made along the south coast of France, in what is now known as the Cosker Cave, after its finder Henry Cosker. First found in 1985, the prehistoric rock art engravings were not made public until 1991, when three divers became lost in the passageway and died. A huge proportion of the cavern, including some of the wall art, was permanently or periodically submerged and destroyed by seawater, leaving only 150 pieces of art dating back to as early as the Upper Paleolithic. They were revealed during World History's Cave Beneath the Sea, after divers traveled 175 meters down to find unique paintings of great auk, an extinct species of flightless bird. The 2018 series revealed, to collaborate in the study of the paintings, one of France's leading cave art specialists, Jean Klotz, was called in. He noticed several unusual things about the paintings. No cave art site had ever been found in the area which was far from the concentrations of well-known painted caves in France. Although images of seals like those in the Cosker Cave had been found on engraved prehistoric objects, Great Auk paintings were unique. Professor Klotz was forced to watch through a live camera stream as a team of divers explored the cave. He explained, I didn't go into the cave because I'm not a diver, but I can say I've been inside the cave through the photographs. Also, through the eyes of my friend Jean Curtin. So through the cameras, I monitored what was going on inside the cave for the whole afternoon. But Professor Klotz and the rest of the team were baffled after discovering the art was not the work from just one historic period. Among the surviving drawings were 65 hand stencils dating back 27,000 years, and also newer art which dates back 19,000 years. The series added. Jean Cowran Radiocarbon dated the paintings to between 18,000 and 19,000 years ago. He was even more surprised when he obtained a much older date for the hands, 27,000 years. It is the oldest painting in the world for a prehistoric period. So the carbon dating evidence shows that there have been two separate periods of human activity within the cave, both far back in the late Ice Age, a time when the climate was much older. It was a time when extinct animals such as mammoths roamed Europe's vast windy prairies, alongside more familiar animals like reindeers, horses, bison and musk. During the glacial periods of the Pleistocene, the shore of the Mediterranean was several miles to the south, and the sea level up to 100 meters below the entrance of the cave. Cosker Cave is significant because it is situated in an area where no Paleolithic art had ever been found before. This underlines the possibility that many prehistoric coastal caves around the Mediterranean in France, Italy and Spain have been lost to rising sea levels, along with all their cave paintings and other artworks. Archaeologists estimate that if Cosker had remained above sea level, it would now contain something like 600 to 800 animal images alone. Mayan Gate to the Underworld found near site of final battle. Archaeologists have discovered hundreds of Mayan artifacts from Lake Petén Itza in Guatemala and believe the site has deeper meaning. Archaeologists believe they have found the Mayan Gateway to the Underworld, complete with evidence of human sacrifice. The find was uncovered just meters from where the ancient civilization fought their final battle with Spain at Lake Petén Itza in Guatemala. A Polish team investigating the area have uncovered hundreds of Mayan artifacts from its waters, including evidence of rituals and even human sacrifice. And, off an island in the middle of the lake, the team believes there is evidence of the final battle between the civilization and its Spanish conquerors. Team leader Magdalena Kresbian of Poland's Jagiellonian University said, The water has very special and symbolic meaning in the ancient Mayan beliefs. It was thought to be the door to the underworld, the world of death. Zibalba, where the gods live. We planned our dives according to written sources and little bit of intuition. We wanted to check places that seemed to be very important to the history of the Itzamaya group. In most of them, we found a lot of artifacts. The team argues that these artifacts were either dropped or lowered into the lake by the Maya as an offering to the gods. One of the artifacts now recovered is an obsidian blade that may have been used to make blood sacrifices. Ancient Maya used blades like this during their rituals, said Magdalena. They could make bloodletting offerings or even kill somebody to offer their blood to the gods. Among the other artifacts from the lake bed are an incense burner and ceramic vessels, including some containing animal bones and one carved with rites. Another intriguing discovery relates to an island in the lake called Flores, which was once home to Najpetan, the capital of the Itzamaya. 
This was the last independent native kingdom in the Americas, until conquistador Martín de Ursa y Arismendi stormed the island in March 13, 1697. Magdalena said most of the written sources say that the battle between the Spaniards and the Maya, who lived in Nojpetan, took place on the west side of the island. We found an artifact in this area, a Maya stone mace head which can be related to the battle. She added, it seems we have confirmed the location of the last battle between the Maya and the Spaniards, and we probably found the area of the ritual activity of the Itza. This is a great beginning to the process of better learning their customs, beliefs, and culture. The ceremonial relics from the lake bed are pre-Columbian, dating from 150 BC up to 800 AD. However, Magdalena is keen to emphasize that her team have only undertaken reconnaissance of the sites, rather than complete excavations. She said, we should make underwater excavations to be sure if the area we found the objects in was the area of ceremonial activity. Right now, we can't be sure about the context of the objects and whether their location is not the result of water movement or other factors. But if we can confirm that in this area, the ritual objects were found in situ, and we think the two ceremonial objects were, at least one part of the lake can be called sacred. Throughout history there have been numerous cases of people who have simply ceased to exist, disappearing forever without explanation or resolution. This is certainly spooky enough when it is just one person, but it becomes decidedly more bizarre when large groups of people abruptly vanish to never be seen again. Indeed, some of the most baffling disappearances in history have to do with mass vanishings that seem to have swallowed up and wiped out hundreds or even thousands of souls, in some cases whole towns, all of which remain gone, and with few clues of what became of them. They have apparently simply ceased to exist. What lies behind these tales and what forces may have been at work to make crowds of people totally blink out of existence? Here we will take a look at some of the more notable mysterious mass disappearances in history, in which a large number of people seem to have almost dissipated into thin air, and which have left profound mysteries and puzzles behind. Perhaps one of the most well-debated mass vanishings of all time comes to us from the cold expanses of the frigid north. Northern Canada is a harsh environment in which to eke out a living. Here in this cold land of eternal, relentlessly icy, biting winds, there was once an Inuit village perched upon the stony shores of the remote Lake Anjakuni. The settlement was a rather prosperous fishing village at the time, with a population of about 1,200 to 2,500 people, who toiled away in the gnawing cold to make a living out here on the outer fringes of civilization. It was here that a fur trapper named Joel Abel came through snow and ice to seek refuge in November of 1930, after an arduous journey overland by snowshoe running trap lines. Labelle had apparently been to this village before, and often relied on the warm welcome and supplies he could expect to receive here, yet this was not to be a typical visit. Upon reaching the village, Labelle found no one there to welcome his arrival, as was usually the case. Finding this rather odd already, he was soon overcome by the sheer, almost deafening silence that emanated from the normally bustling village, as he stood there in the cold, buffeted by wind and a glaring void of any other sound. None of the activity he had come to expect from this normally booming fishing town was anywhere to be seen, and his shouts out into the still village were answered with the howling of wind. Labelle cautiously made his way into the village, and it was not long before more eerie discoveries were made in the frigid, deathly silence. He passed a group of emaciated sled dogs dead in the snow, frozen solid and half buried in snowdrifts, seeming to have starved to death out in the bleakness. A peek into several of the snow-caked shacks in which the villagers lived showed that personal items remained, as well as weapons such as rifles. There were also meals on tables and even pots that had been left cooking over fires, whose charred contents had since gone cold, save for a few that hung over some still smoldering embers. Everything remained undisturbed and just as it had been left, and there was no sign of any struggle or anything out of the ordinary, except the fact that there was not a soul to be seen anywhere. For all appearances it seemed as if someone should have been coming back at any moment, but no one did. It seemed that every single inhabitant of the village had simply vanished. When Labelle left the ghostly silence behind and made his way back to civilization, he immediately reported the situation to the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who launched an investigation into the matter. They would also find an abandoned village in which all of the huts and shacks had been left totally undisturbed, and with all provisions and weapons left exactly where they were supposed to be. Even the storehouses had remained untouched, their contents sitting silently in the frigid, silent cold. 
The authorities also found the dead sled dogs tied to a tree and frozen into the landscape, and they made the further chilling discovery of sacred graves that had apparently been emptied, their contents nowhere to be seen. Indeed, there were no signs of tracks or footprints in the snow, and no indication of where everyone could have possibly gone. In the November 23, 1930 edition of the Toronto Daily Star, it is explained that the RCMP would return to confirm what LaBelle had claimed, that the entire village had just spontaneously disappeared, apparently with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Eerily, it was later alleged that other nearby villagers reported to the police that there had been numerous sightings of strange lights in the skies over the abandoned village in the days leading up to LaBelle's unsettling discovery, although this is very likely a spooky element to the story added later to give it another dimension of bizarreness. The story of the vanishing Inuit village of Lake Anjakuni has achieved legendary status in the world of the unexplained, in particular cases involving strange disappearances. The problem is that it is uncertain just how much of the tale actually really happened and how much has been embellished or even flat out fabricated over time. It seems that there is very little truly reliable evidence or information which can shed light on just how much of this bizarre story is actually true. In the absence of any new developments and with little concrete information to go on, the vanishing village of Lake Anjakuni will likely always remain just a scary story surrounded by questions which we will likely never know the answers to. The village of Lake Anijakuni is certainly not the only settlement that has gone mysteriously missing. Indeed, one of the most well-known baffling vanishings in history is the strange case of the lost colony of Roanoke Island. In 1587, the first permanent English colony of the New World was established on the island of Roanoke, an 8-mile long, 2-mile wide sliver of land lying within a chain of barrier islands called the Outer Banks, off the coast of the U.S. state of North Carolina. Around 120 settlers including men, women, and children, braved hardship and a long sea journey to start a new life here, led by a John White, whose own granddaughter, Virginia Dare, was to be the first English person born on the continent of North America. Life in the new colony was hard, and the settlers faced severe unforgiving weather and a lack of supplies, as well as a rocky relationship with the native tribes of the area, due to confrontations with an earlier failed settlement here in 1584, which had ended in violence. Things eventually got to the point where White was forced to return to England to load up on various things the colony desperately needed. As he said his goodbyes to friends and loved ones who would stay behind and sailed out over the horizon, White did not think that it would be long before he was back with his colony and family. The original plan was to return to the Roanoke colony within three months with the needed supplies, but there were some unforeseen obstacles. England's war with Spain had created a situation in which every available ship was needed for the war effort, shipping had been banned due to the relentless attacks from the Spanish Armada, and subsequently White's own ship was confiscated. Rather than the three months originally intended, White wouldn't return to Roanoke until August of 1590, around three years later than anticipated. When White finally sailed into Roanoke, he was not greeted with the sight of the community and loved ones he had left. In fact, he was not greeted by anyone at all. When White disembarked with his men to search the village, he found that the settlement had been completely and utterly deserted. Homes had been orderly disassembled and removed, yet there was no trace of where all of the settlers had gone. It was as if the village had been erased from existence. A complete search of the area turned up only a few eerie clues, the word Croton hastily carved into a tree, and the letters Crow carved into another tree. Other than that, there were no signs of a struggle or anything amiss, other than the complete lack of any signs of life. They had simply vanished. White surmised that the carved words meant that the settlers had relocated to an island to the south, now known as Hatteras Island, which at the time was the home of a tribe of friendly natives, known as the Croton. Indeed, before his departure three years earlier, he had instructed the settlers that if ever they were forced to leave the island, they were to carve the name of their destination into a tree, along with a Maltese cross, if there was danger involved in their movement, such as an attack from the hostile natives or a natural disaster. In both of the carvings found there was no cross, making it a mystery as to why they would have left in the first place. White had the full intention of making the journey to the Croton Island, but he was besieged with foul weather and a bedraggled crew who were uncooperative almost to the point of mutiny. Vanquished by these obstacles, White had no choice but to return to England, never to come back and leaving the fate of the settlers, which included his own daughter and granddaughter, unresolved. It is a mystery that centuries later we are still not really much closer to solving. There have been many theories as to what happened to the vanished lost colony of Roanoke Island. 
Some think that the settlers were attacked and killed by aggressive natives who did not take kindly to foreign settlers coming to invade their lands and who had had violent confrontations with foreign settlers before. Others think that a mysterious disease killed off the colonists, which is an odd theory, considering there was not a single body or grave to be found. Still other theories point to some violent cataclysm such as a hurricane, that they were attacked by more aiding Spanish forces scouring the coast, or even that they tried to leave the New World to sail back to England, only to be swallowed into a watery grave by the sea. It is also quite possible that the settlers did indeed go to Hatteras Island to assimilate with the natives there, just as White had predicted. Over the ensuing centuries there have been occasional frustrating clues as to what happened to the colonists, but no answer has really ever congealed, and for all of the speculation we ultimately just don't know. Until more concrete evidence becomes available, the mystery of Roanoke Island's lost colony will perhaps forever elude us. Another curious account of a disappearing settlement is that of the village of Hoa Verde in Brazil. On February 5, 1923, a group of visitors to this small hamlet of 600 people were amazed to discover that there was not a soul to be found anywhere in the town, and homes and other buildings had been abandoned in great haste, with personal belongings and food left behind as is. Authorities launched an investigation, but could find no sign of where any of the inhabitants had gone. The only clues left behind were a single gun that had been recently fired and a message scrawled on a blackboard that read there is no salvation. Theories of what happened to the 600 banished residents of Hoer Verde range from the plausible notion that they were forced to evacuate due to attacks from roving guerrillas or drug dealers, to the more far-out idea that they were abducted by aliens, but there is unfortunately very little evidence to make any conclusions, and the case of Brazil's vanishing village remains a baffling conundrum. Joining the ranks of bizarre mass disappearances are those of large amounts of soldiers that for reasons left unexplained have vanished without a trace. Perhaps the most well-known of these cases is that of the mysterious disappearance of the Roman 9th Legion. Formed originally in around 65 BC, the 9th Legion was the most ruthless and greatly feared fighting force in the Roman Empire's military, consisting of around 5,000 of the empire's most skilled and highly trained fighting men, pulled from a variety of countries. By the 2nd century AD, the extremely well-armed, highly trained army of the 9th Legion, had laid waste to enemies in far-flung locales, as far and wide as Africa, Germania Spain, the Balkans, and Britain, and were instrumental in maintaining Rome's iron grip across its vast empire. Indeed in the 2nd century AD, the 9th Legion was at the tip of the spear that Rome was trying to drive into an insurgence from untamed rampaging tribes of painted-faced barbarians churning within Britain at the time. It was a conflict that would test Rome's might, as it was suffering great losses here against barbarian hordes and struggling to keep Britain under its control. In particular under the reign of Emperor Hadrian, AD 117-138, the Romans were losing large numbers of soldiers to the bloody battlefields of Britain, and the whole engagement was so extremely worrying to leaders in Rome that they would even eventually erect a huge wall, called Hadrian's Wall, to keep the enemy out. It was into this horrific maelstrom of fighting and turmoil that the 9th Legion marched in around 109 AD, when they pushed forth into what is now known as Scotland, to face an enemy that terrified most soldiers, with their primitive face paint streaked across fierce visages, attire of ragged bear and wolf skins over substantial bear flesh, even in the middle of winter, fierce tattoos, booming war drums, and their mystical shamans, howling prayers to ancient Celtic gods in the midst of battle. These barbarians were seen as a ruthless enemy the likes of which no one had ever seen before, yet the 9th Legion bravely marched forth to engage and push them north. This vast force of heavily armored soldiers would go forth to engage and would never be seen again, thousands of men gone without a trace, not a single one ever to be accounted for. The disappearance would go on to grip the public imagination with the publishing of such works as Rosemary Sutcliffe's 1954 book, The Eagle of the Ninth, which was an instant bestseller when released. The mystery of the missing Roman 9th Legion has become legend and a baffling historical oddity that has never really seen a satisfactory answer. There are of course many theories as to what happened to the Roman 9th Legion. One of the more plausible ones put forward by historians is that there was nothing mysterious going on at all, chalking it up to the Legion merely slowly transferring to other battlefields in Britain or the Middle East, or even disbanding altogether. The legends of Scotland like to portray a different scenario, that the well-equipped formidable Roman fighting force was whittled away by tenacious guerrilla attacks by the very under-equipped primitive forces they were trying to eradicate. Some rumors that leaked from the battlefield at the time suggested that a catastrophic battle had ensued between the Roman forces and the Celtic tribes, which had resulted in devastating repercussions. 
However, for all of the theories, there is little archaeological evidence to settle the matter once and for all. All we know is that, for whatever reasons, Rome's most exalted, feared fighting force totally disappeared from the records, only to move on into the realm of mystery and legend. The disappearance of the Roman Ninth Legion continues to capture the imagination. It has been covered in a wide variety of media from books, to TV, to film. Recently, two films devoted to exploring the conundrum were released practically back-to-back, -back, with the 2010 film Centurion followed one year later by 2011's The Eagle, both giving different takes on the disappearance. Yet for all of the theories, debate and speculation, the tale of the vanishing of Rome's Ninth Legion is still unresolved and will likely continue to bore its way into myth and legend for some time to come. A similarly baffling vanishing of an entire military force is said to have occurred in China sometime around the year 1937. This was during the Second Sino-Japanese War, in the days leading up to this tragic stain on history, Chinese Colonel Li Fuxian had been engaged in a desperate effort to staunch the coming invasion by placing 3,000 heavily armed reinforcement troops along a 2-mile line in order to defend a major strategic bridge over the Yangtze River, where they waited for the inevitable Japanese onslaught. The defensive line set up artillery and heavy guns in the hopes of unleashing them upon their ruthless enemy, and the colonel himself fell back to his headquarters to await the attack he knew was coming. The following morning, the colonel was awoken by an aide who brought news that all contact with the defensive position had been lost. Baffled, Li Fuxian had an expedition launched to the line to check on their current situation, and this is where things got bizarre indeed. When the investigation team arrived, it became apparent that the entire line of over 3,000 men was simply and totally gone. Posts were completely abandoned, and artillery and heavy guns had been left where they were, fully loaded, locked in firing positions, but dead and unused. There was no sign of blood or a struggle of any kind, indeed no sign at all as to where everyone had gone at all. It was as if the men had just blinked out of existence. Two sentries far away at the end of the bridge were still at their posts and claimed that no one had come through that way. In fact, there were several sentry posts set up throughout the area and none had seen any sort of movement from the large force of men. How could they have silently and stealthily have moved without any word to their superiors and without notice by these sentry posts? In the aftermath of the war, there were some efforts made to reach some closure to what had happened to the 3,000-plus armed men, but Japanese records held no hint as to their ultimate fate, and it remains a perplexing unsolved mass disappearance to this day. Considering that the Japanese have done everything in their power to cover up and hide the various atrocities committed in China during the war, it is highly likely that we will never know for sure what happened to these troops. Further weirdness came about in the following years, when in 1945 a train carrying hundreds of passengers heading from Guandan to Shanghai, China, failed to reach its destination, and intensive searches turned up no trace of where the train or its people had gone. The only thing turned up of note during the search for the train was an odd lake that had seemingly sprung up from nowhere. In November of the same year, a group of around 100 Soviet forces heading for a train station suddenly and inexplicably vanished en route. A subsequent investigation turned up a camp that had been halfway set up and a fire that had been put out, but no sign of where the men had gone. What lies at the heart of these sorts of mass vanishings? Is there some rational explanation or is there something far more bizarre than we can possibly imagine at work here? There have been numerous theories as to what may lie behind these mysterious disappearances, ranging from meteorite strikes to spontaneous earthbound black holes or interdimensional portals that open up to swallow large numbers of people before flickering out of existence, to UFOs, to even an ancient Greek god known as Proteus, which is said to be a vast mass of protoplasm that lies dormant deep in the bowels of the earth to occasionally surface to feed. The Proteus theory was in modern days suggested by the author Dean Koontz, who wrote of this as an explanation for mass disappearances in his horror novel Phantoms. Koontz explained, It is an enormous mass of protoplasm covering maybe an area of some square kilometers. Some millions years of age, it is probably one of the very first forms of life existing in the entrails of Earth or deep in the ocean. Once or twice in a century it eats people dissolving and digesting them almost entirely. Deep pools of water were found in the huts of Roanoke Colony. A Chinese pilot searching for a mist train spotted from air a small lake that seemed to emerge from nowhere. Frozen water was found in the huts of an abandoned small Eskimo village on the shores of Lake Anjakuni, Canada, in 1930. The human body is 90% water, and that was perhaps all that was left of the dissolved victims of Proteus. Could any of this possibly be that bizarre? What are we to make of the sudden inexplicable vanishings of hundreds or even thousands of people? Are we to ever know the fate of these lost, forgotten souls?
Did they ever even happen at all or is this all just spooky superstition wrapped into history? While we may not have and perhaps never will have the answers to these questions, it is certainly compelling and not a little frightening to think about the notion that at times this world we live on potentially has the ability to open up and just swallow us up or wipe us off the face of the earth without a trace. Experiments in sound or acoustic levitation are common and ongoing. Dozens of researchers have managed to use sound waves to levitate and move tiny particles in liquid droplets. Multiple vibrating plates are used to create different frequencies and move an acoustic field with particles trapped inside. The techniques developed have not been used to lift heavy or large objects. 21st century scientists do not yet know if such a thing is possible. But there have been breakthroughs, some of which are significant enough to suggest that large-scale acoustic levitation may someday be possible. In two experiments, scientists have successfully levitated lightweight polystyrene balls greater in size than the wavelengths used to elevate them, which represents an important step forward in the management of the force of concentrated sound. One of these experiments, carried out by a joint team of researchers in the UK and Brazil in 2016, lifted a 50mm polystyrene ball several centimeters off the ground, where it remained suspended for as long as the sound waves were generated. Just one year later, another group of researchers working out of the University of Bristol successfully levitated a polystyrene ball of 2 cm in diameter. These experiments might seem redundant. But researchers used two entirely different methods for achieving this feat. The UK-Brazil team surpassed previous limits on the size of the object levitated by aligning three ultrasonic transducers, devices that convert electric energy into sound energy, in a tripod arrangement. Their combined effects created a standing, stationary, sound wave that in effect, negated the force of gravity in a localized area. The University of Bristol team, on the other hand, combined a single ultrasonic transducer with a sound reflector to manufacture a standing sound wave, which maintained its stationary status after being repeatedly reflected back on itself. These studies prove that levitation through the manipulation of sound waves is possible and that more than one way exists to get the job done. Future experimentation may uncover even more methods for using sound to overcome the force of gravity, and some of them may be more potent than the techniques developed so far. One theory credits the building of the pyramids and other megalithic monuments to acoustic levitation. No first-hand accounts exist, but later written testimony provides some intriguing and suggestive clues. Abul Hassan Ali al-Masudi, an Arab historian from the 10th century AD, wrote about ancient Egypt and the methods he alleges they used to move massive stones, including those used to build the pyramids. He claimed that a magic papyrus imprinted with symbols was placed under each stone, after which a metal rod was struck against the stone to initiate the levitation process. According to al-Masudi, the stone would be guided along a fenced path with metal poles placed on each side. Some believe these poles could have been used to create high-frequency sound vibrations, which would have been responsible for creating the levitation effects. Outside of this written testimony, which is open to interpretation, there is no direct evidence to suggest the pyramids were constructed by acoustic levitation. But the Great Pyramid of Giza does possess some extraordinary acoustic properties, demonstrating the capacity to dramatically amplify sounds generated at certain frequencies. The Egyptians who built the pyramids on the Giza Plateau clearly knew a lot about sound and knew how it could be used to produce powerful effects possibly including levitation. Another creation that some have credited to sonic or acoustic levitation is the Coral Castle, which is located in southeastern Florida, not far from the city of Miami. The Coral Castle is a sprawling stone city built by Latvian-American immigrant Edward Lidskalnin between the years 1923 and 1951. The Coral Castle complex is constructed from nearly 1,000 tons of rock, which Lidskalnin somehow cut, shaped, lifted and maneuvered into place all by himself. Lidskalnin refused to allow visitors or observers on site while he was working, so there are no eyewitness accounts detailing his construction methods. There were no reports of mysterious sounds coming from the vicinity of the Coral Castle during the construction phase, but sonic levitation generally relies on the use of sound frequencies that are inaudible to humans. In his writings and conversations, Lidskalnin never specifically identified sound as a key factor in his work. But it is known that he had an interest in radio and possessed a range of radio equipment, which he used for unknown purposes. Lidskalnin at one point told someone he knew how to tune into the music of the stars, a reference that could have either literal or metaphorical connotations.
In explaining his amazing feats, the perpetually enigmatic Lidskalnan proclaimed the following. I have discovered the secrets of the pyramids and have found out how the Egyptians and the ancient builders in Peru, Yucatan and Asia, with only primitive tools, raised and set and placed blocks of stone weighing many tons. There is an implication here that somehow these ancient masters had developed a method for overcoming the force of gravity. Just exactly how Lidskalnan would have discovered the secrets of the ancients is unknown. Many anecdotal tales of acoustic levitation come from travelers in the Far East, who claimed to have encountered mystics or ascetics who possessed the ability to levitate objects, sometimes with the assistance of sound. One fascinating story came from a medical doctor named Jarl, who had been brought to a remote area of Tibet in 1939 to treat a Tibetan Buddhist holy man, suffering from an unknown illness. After spending some time among the monks he eventually gained their confidence, and to show their appreciation, they performed a demonstration in sonic levitation that left Dr. Jarl astounded. In a clearing, the monks arranged 19 musical instruments, 13 drums and 6 trumpets, in a 90-degree arc around a large heavy stone. On cue, they began to play these instruments in unison, singing and chanting at the same time. After a few moments the stone suddenly lifted into the air, and it continued to rise until it landed on a hilltop perch approximately 250 meters above the ground. The demonstration was repeated multiple times for Dr. Jarl, who claimed the films he made of this procedure were confiscated by the English Scientific Society, which had sponsored his trip to Asia. The drawings Dr. Jarl made of this procedure have survived to this day, although the films he allegedly made have never surfaced. A few years ago, sonic drilling technology was developed by NASA as a means to mine materials from rocks and other hard materials encountered on space missions. This helped boost interest in the capacity of sound to generate force, including the power necessary to levitate physical objects. Compared to stories of heavy stones lifted high into the air by chanting and drum-playing monks, the achievements of 21 ST-century scientists may not seem impressive. But they do show that sound waves can be used to accomplish amazing things, and controlled experiments are more authoritative than unproven anecdotes from the distant past. Acoustic levitation is real, and as scientists learn more about how it works their ability to harness it will likely advance by leaps and bounds. Renovations at Lincoln Cathedral unearth 50 mysterious medieval burials. Before we start, please take a moment to give this video a like. Subscribe to Blast World Mysteries and hit the bell icon so you'll never miss these great stories. Mysterious burials have been found underneath England's iconic Lincoln Cathedral. Four years ago, archaeologists, historians and other experts began excavating and renovating the Lincoln Cathedral in the East Midlands, UK. This city is known as Cathedral City and the Lincoln Cathedral is the area's most prized Gothic landmark. So far, in an amazing surprise, archaeologists have uncovered more than 50 graves, most recently one of a medieval priest, a rare find that dates back to the 12th or 13th century. In addition to the priest's remains, archaeologists have found a pewter chalice and other objects used when giving communion during Mass. Other objects found in addition to skeletal remains include a hand from an ancient statue and a very rare coin. The coin bears the image of Edward the Confessor who was the last king of Wessex and ruled from 1042 until 1066. This project, begun in 2016, was not started solely for archaeological purposes, but rather to allow for the installation of new sewage and drainage pipes, landscaping, and of course refurbishment of the cathedral. The work is being funded by the National Lottery. Later this year, the relics found will be put on exhibit in the new Lincoln Cathedral Visitor Center, which officials hope will open sometime this summer. Archaeologists have also discovered important and historic ancient Roman buildings in the vicinity of the coming visitor center. They found ornate wall plaster, an almost perfectly preserved incense burner, a Roman spoon and a container used for perfume. The plaster, though not complete, has a detailed pattern of leaves and flowers on part of it. On the other parts are colored bands. Experts hope to eventually be able to recreate the walls in their entirety. Natasha Powers is a senior manager with Allen Archaeology, the firm in charge of the excavation. She's been on the project since the beginning and recently told the media, Since our work began in 2016, we've uncovered significant evidence of Lincoln's medieval, Saxon and Roman past. The objects we found are not only beautiful and interesting in themselves, but importantly they enable us to better interpret the lives of those who occupied the city in previous centuries. 
Work on the cathedral and the excavations currently underway are scheduled for completion by 2022. It isn't only what's beneath the cathedral's grounds that's incredibly important to historians. The church itself is, and has been for centuries, a vital part of this community that today is home to almost 95,000 people. The renovations had a budget of more than 12 million pounds, but already costs are predicted to exceed that. According to Ann Irving, who is the project manager of the church, the restoration was important to the community as the archaeological dig happened on its doorstep. In May 2019, Irving told Telegraph News website, We are building out the Lincolnshire limestone, which is like a hard cheese. There's a lot of intricate Gothic carving which weathers and bits fall off. Still, Irving said, the work is necessary, not just for churchgoers today, but for those who will attend the church in the future. We're not just thinking about our generation, she told the Telegraph, but the generations beyond us and what they'll have to face if the repairs are not tended to now. And churchgoers are not the only folks who love the Lincoln Cathedral. TV and movie producers love it too. In 2005, the church stood in, so to speak, for Westminster Abbey in the film The Da Vinci Code, starring Tom Hanks. So while costs for the renovation and the archaeological dig may rise, so will the cathedral's fame and profile. And perhaps visitors to the UK will make a point of going to Lincoln, seeing the cathedral, and visiting the town. That means tourism, which means money flowing into local businesses. Perhaps they'll stop in at the visitor center and see the exhibit of the ancient priest excavated recently and the artifacts found with him. When history and economics combine, it can mean a win-win for everyone involved. French archaeologists in San El Hager have discovered hundreds of colored and inscribed limestone blocks, which they believe were used to build the sacred lake walls of a temple dedicated to the goddess Mut. The limestone blocks may have belonged to King Asorkin II of the 22nd dynasty and used for either a temple or chapel, announced Dr. Zarhi Hawass, Minister of State for Antiquities today. The stone may have also been reused in the late period and the Ptolemaic era. Dr. Hawass added that following a complete excavation and study of the blocks, the French mission would reconstruct the original arrangement to determine if they are from a temple or chapel. Dr. Philippe Brissot, director of the French mission, confirmed that the sacred lake measures about 30 meters by 12 meters, with a depth of 6 meters. The team has so far cleaned about 120 blocks, 78 of which have inscriptions. Two blocks belong to King Asorkin III, while the inscriptions mention the title Mistress Mud of Asheru Lake, indicating both goddess and lake during the 21st and 22nd dynasties. Dr. Muhammad Abdul Maxid, head of office at the Ministry of State for Antiquities, said that this discovery adds great importance to the San El Hager site, one of the most archaeologically rich areas of the Delta, known as the Thebes of the North. The region is a huge priority for the Ministry of State for Antiquities to lower the water table, control agricultural drainage, and build an open-site museum, complete with visitors' center, tourist facilities and a museum magazine. General manager of Sharkio Archaeological Sites mentioned that San El Hager, Tanis during the Pharaonic era, 70 kilometers northeast of Zagazig City, is one of the oldest Egyptian cities and contains many temples belonging to the god Amun. It was the capital of Egypt during the 21st and 22nd dynasties. Excavation work began at this site in 1860 by August Mariette, followed in 1884 by Flinders Petrie, who discovered the Temple of Amun inside the old city. From 1928 to 1958 a French mission directed by Pierre Montet excavated the temples of Mud and Horus and the treasure of the Royal Necropolis, currently on display at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Now under the direction of Dr. Philippe Brissot, the inscriptions of this latest discovery are thought to be amongst the best quality reliefs to be found in Egypt. The Mysterious Chinese People Who Disappeared Overnight According to the story, all the Chinese people who disappeared during a night in 1987, not only the people, about 10,000, but also their cats, dogs, and even cattle. Apparently, there were no signs of what had happened, and all the houses seemed to have been evicted quickly, with meals prepared on tables and abandoned belongings. But this was only the beginning, as reports began to appear that claimed that in the days before the disappearance, there had been numerous UFO sightings in the area. 
On one occasion, some neighbors allegedly saw an eight-light formation in the sky just above the town for about half an hour and caused the clouds to turn black before emitting a bright purple flash and a loud explosion. In the strange world of disappearances and people who have apparently ceased to exist, there is the phenomenon of peoples who simply vanished for no apparent reason. To think that a whole population can disappear without a trace is really scary, which in turn causes all kinds of speculation about what might have happened. But whoever thinks that it is quite difficult for a town to disappear has to know that there have been well-documented cases throughout our history, such as Roanoke Colony on Roanoke Island, in Dare County, now North Carolina, United States, Anjakuni, the missing Eskimo people in Canada, or the picnic in Hanging Rock in Australia, a group of students in a school boarding school that disappeared inexplicably. And a very curious story that appeared not long ago has to do with a town in a remote area of China, which supposedly disappeared overnight. Located in a region of central China, in the province of Shaanxi, which extends 205,800 square kilometers and covers the majestic Wei Valley, Lowe's Plateau, the Muas Desert, and the Qin Mountains. In this place was a rural town like any other that was in the region, with nothing particularly out of the ordinary or exceptional, apart from its proximity to a rocket launch center. But in 2010, a great stir was formed in Chinese social networks when the story of how this small town disappeared completely from the face of the earth became known. They also said that the area was infested with snakes shortly before the town disappeared for unknown reasons, and the reason why the case was not known until 23 years later was that the Chinese government covered up the incident. According to the New Tang Dynasty television media, the inhabitants were transferred in the middle of the night as part of an operation that was linked to a secret project, probably of a military nature, although, supposedly, there is a nuclear base buried somewhere deep in the mountains. A large number of troops were sent to the place, all the people were taken to another place during the night, including people and animals. The mysterious operation had a code name, Operation Night Cat. Some witnesses even claimed to have seen people climbing in military trucks. In addition, in the days after the disappearance of the town, numerous military vehicles, tanks, and even missile launchers appeared in the area, which caused all kinds of speculation, from cover-ups of a disaster to UFOs. Of course, the Chinese government completely denied having participated in the mysterious disappearance of the people. Given that these stories have their origin in social networks, along with Chinese internet censorship, anyone can think that it is only an urban legend, fueled by the total inability to corroborate the stories. But we must also remember how disasters concealed by the Chinese government have occurred, such as the famous catastrophe of March 3, 1996, in Zichang. Details about the worst rocket launch accident in history are only known because it was witnessed by numerous foreign experts. As Air and Space Smithsonian Magazine reported in 2013, the town near the launch center disappeared, as if it never existed. At present, there is no monument to the victims, and its history has never been mentioned in the state-controlled Chinese press. But it must also be said that the case of the Shaanxi people is completely different, especially because of the strange lights in the sky, the appearance of several UFOs, and dozens of snakes sliding down the mountains to protect themselves from a seemingly invisible danger. In the end, we only have more questions than answers. Did this town really disappear without a trace during the night, and if so, why? Was he evacuated by the military for unknown reasons? Did it relate to UFOs that were supposedly seen? Is it just a conspiracy, an urban internet legend or is there something else? Warsaw, Poland. As Polish river levels fall to record lows amid a prolonged drought, the material remains of Poland's tortured 20th century history are coming to light on newly exposed riverbeds, the human remains of Soviet fighter pilots and their plane being found in recent days. Those discoveries follow that of stone fragments from the early 20th century Poniatowski Bridge across the Vistula River in Warsaw, which the Germans blew up in 1944. The Vistula River is hiding no end of secrets. They are everywhere said Johnny Daniels who waded into a shallow area of the Vistula on Tuesday picking up fragments of stones with Hebrew lettering. Officials knew that archaeological remnants remained hidden under wild and murky waters of the Vistula River or its tributaries. But it was impossible to carry out searches for them until now. Amid a prolonged drought, the Vistula, which flows 1,047 kilometers from the Beskidi Mountains to the Baltic Sea, is at its lowest level since measurements started in the late 18th century leading explorers and fortune hunters to comb riverbanks across the country. 
On Sunday, explorers found the remnant of the Soviet fighter-bomber plane in the Bzur River, a tributary of the Vistula, near the village of Kamian in central Poland. The pieces have been moved to a museum in nearby Wisegrad for examination, with more recovery work planned for Saturday. The head of the museum, Zdzislaw Laschinski, told the Associated Press that parts of Soviet uniforms, a parachute, a sheepskin coat collar, parts of boots, a pilot's personal TT pistol and radio equipment were found. The inscriptions on the control panel and on the radio equipment are in Cyrillic. The uncovered remnants are part of the larger story of a devastating war that played out across Poland from 1939 to 1945. Warsaw, Poland. As Polish river levels fall to record lows amid a prolonged drought, the material remains of Poland's tortured 20th century history are coming to light on newly exposed riverbeds, the human remains of Soviet fighter pilots and their plane being found in recent days. Those discoveries follow that of stone fragments from the early 20th century Poniatowski Bridge across the Vistula River in Warsaw, which the Germans blew up in 1944. The Vistula River is hiding no end of secrets. They are everywhere said Johnny Daniels who waded into a shallow area of the Vistula on Tuesday, picking up fragments of stones with Hebrew lettering. Officials knew that archaeological remnants remained hidden under wild and murky waters of the Vistula River or its tributaries. But it was impossible to carry out searches for them until now. Amid a prolonged drought, the Vistula, which flows 1,047 kilometers from the Beskidi Mountains to the Baltic Sea, is at its lowest level since measurements started in the late 18th century leading explorers and fortune hunters to comb riverbanks across the country. On Sunday, explorers found the remnant of the Soviet fighter-bomber plane in the Bzur River, a tributary of the Vistula, near the village of Kamian in central Poland. The pieces have been moved to a museum in nearby Wisegrad for examination, with more recovery work planned for Saturday. The head of the museum, Zdzislaw Laschinski, told the Associated Press that parts of Soviet uniforms, a parachute, a sheepskin coat collar, parts of boots, a pilot's personal TT pistol and radio equipment were found. The inscriptions on the control panel and on the radio equipment are in Cyrillic. The uncovered remnants are part of the larger story of a devastating war that played out across Poland from 1939 to 1945. Artifacts found in rediscovered sacred cave could change our understanding of the Maya. The National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico has announced a remarkable discovery that will provide new insights into the Maya. Experts found a sacred cave where rituals were performed, filled with priceless artifacts. The find was made by archaeologists in a cave system in the Yucatan, and it is hoped that they will allow scientists to have a better understanding of the reasons for the collapse and fall of the Maya. The find was made by a team of archaeologists who were looking for sacred wells in a cave system near the abandoned Maya city of Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. The project, which was partly funded by the National Geographic, was exploring the Balancanchi's network of caverns. According to the Washington Post, Balamaku is about 1.7 miles or 2.75 kilometers east of the main pyramid of Kokukan at Chichen Itza. This cave system was once sacred to the Maya rain god Chak. The exploration of the cave. The exploration of the cave started in 2018 and experts were looking for a well that they believed was under the pyramid of Kokukan. Some local Maya informed archaeologists of an incredible story from over 50 years earlier. They told the experts working at Chichen Itza that a discovery had been made deep in the cavern in 1966, but the lead archaeologist had sealed up the cave, possibly to preserve the find, and it was then simply forgotten about. This persuaded archaeologists that there was something else in the caverns apart from the holy well, and they began to explore the cave system. This meant crawling deep into the often narrow cave on their stomachs with only a small light attached to their helmets. After much fruitless searching, one day, archaeologist Guillermo de Anda found something that was so astonishing that it made him almost cry. A treasure trove. In the cavern, he saw approximately 155 ritual items and offerings that had lain untouched for centuries. All of the items are made of ceramic and include bowls, plates, boxes, incense burners, and braziers, 
and they contain organic material and possibly fragments of animal bones. The archaeologists knew that they had found a sacred cave where the Maya had once performed some of their most important and secretive ceremonies. The items that have been discovered have lain so long in the cave that stalactites have grown up ar around them, and for the moment, the precious hoard has been left in place. According to the National Geographic, for these Mesoamericans, caves and cenotes, or sinkholes, were considered openings to the underworld. It seemed like that ceremonies and rituals were performed in the cave to win favor of the rain god, who was very important for the Maya in their arid and dry homeland. The Maya had to crawl into the cave to perform these rites, and only priests and royalty were probably in attendance when offerings were made to the rain god. The experts have begun a preliminary investigation of the items found in the cavern. As expected, they found artifacts with a representation of the Mayan god Chak. However, they also found a surprising effigy of the rain god Tialoc, according to Newsweek, who was a rain god from the central Mexican highlands. This was stunning and would, would suggest that the Maya were influenced by other cultures and this could be very important in understanding the emergence of their civilization and history. The Collapse of the Maya and Climate Change The offerings, which will be dated, are all related to rain. If the local inhabitants of Chichen Itza made a great many offerings in a short period, it could indicate low rainfall and a possible drought at a given time. The objects can help scientists determine if an increasingly dry climate caused by deforestation led to the fall of the Mayan civilization in the 13th to 14th century. The Sun reports that the offering to the rain gods can shed light on the catastrophic droughts that are likely to have provoked the collapse of the Mayan civilization. This find is leading scientists to develop new strategies for subterranean archaeological excavations. For example, they are using 3D imaging to visualize the sacred cavern and to understand how the Maya viewed this revered space. Members of the team working on the site also believe that it can demonstrate the importance of archaeology to help to identify the impact of climatic change on past cultures, and this can teach modern societies how to become more sustainable. Gold looted from the Aztecs some 500 years ago was found to have been stolen by famous Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés, archaeologists have revealed. The 1.93 kg slab of gold was discovered in a park in Mexico City in 1981 by a construction worker during excavations for a new building along the Alameda. How it got there remained a mystery, as the Aztec civilization ruled in a more southern part of Mexico, while the capital city is more north of where the Aztecs once ruled. However, analysis of a Spanish invader's diary revealed the gold bar was looted by Hernán Cortés in 1520. Cortés was a famous Spanish conquistador who docked at Veracruz in April 1519. The following year, on June 30, the Spanish were forced to temporarily retreat as they had just slaughtered the Aztecs' nobles and priests, leaving the Aztecs furious in a night known as Noche Triste, or Sad Night. However, Cortés did not leave without a gift and decided to take the weighty piece of gold with him before evidently losing it. A statement from Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History INA, said. The so-called Noche Triste is among the episodes of the conquest that will be remembered this year, and there is only one piece of material evidence from it. A gold bar that sank 500 years ago in the canals of Tenochtitlan, and which recent analysis confirms came from the Spaniards flight. This bar is a key piece in the puzzle of this historical event. Inna also recently discovered two 500-year anchors were uncovered at the Gulf of Mexico which belonged to Cortes. The two anchors were embedded in sediment, at depths between 33 and 50 feet. The divers then reburied the anchors in order to preserve them. Remarkably, an intact wooden crosspiece had been discovered in the same vicinity last year. Subsequent analysis concluded the artifact dates somewhere between 1450 and 1530, the same period in which Cortes arrived in the area. Cortes intentionally sunk 10 ships to prevent potential dissident soldiers deserting to Cuba, according to historical documents. The anchors were recently found at the location in which the sinking is thought to have taken place. Inna said that the anchors were in a southwesterly direction, which is further indication that they may have been part of Cortes's fleet.
the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire was a huge event in their colonization of the Americas. Cortes conquered the Aztecs against the odds. He did so by forming alliances with various indigenous groups, turning groups against each other. King Charles I of Spain, however, appointed him the governor of New Spain shortly afterward, in 1522.